John chapter 17. If you need to take a Bible home, please don't take the one in the back of the seat, but we have plenty uh, on the shelf right back here, and you're welcome to take a Bible off that shelf, take it home and read it, find someone to read it with you. John 17. Now let's back up and just get the full uh, effect by beginning at verse 1 with the high priestly prayer of Jesus. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, just as you have given him authority over all flesh to give everlasting life to those whom you have given him. And this is everlasting life, that they might know you, the only true God, and he whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth, having finished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. And now our focus today in verses 6 and following. I manifested your name. To the people that you gave me out of the world, yours they were, and to me you gave them, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you gave me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those that you gave me for yours, they are. All mine are yours and yours mine. And I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. Penetrate our hearts, Holy Spirit, with the power of the prayer of this perfect prophet, priest, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Be glorified today. In his name, amen. Have you read the Song of Solomon lately? Anybody? Probably if you're uh, doing a read-through plan, you're probably nowhere near the the Song of Solomon yet. Um, It will come in time. So none of you have read it recently, the Song of Songs, some people call it. Uh, It's a book about love and romance God's way. And it's a beautiful picture of what real love, the love of God, looks like even from a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband. You, you remember in that book, if you're familiar with it, just how over the top the, the lover's language is towards one another. I mean, they just describe one another like they're the, the, the greatest things since sliced bread. Uh, that's what couples do. They've been married a long, long time, and by God's grace, they've, they've learned about real love. Um, the Bible says love covers multitude of sins or offenses. It's through our glory, the Proverbs say, to overlook offenses. And um, husband and wife have been married many years. They've learned to cover one another's weaknesses and to highlight strengths to give grace. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things, and believes all things, and hopes all things. Well, something like that is happening now in this prayer of Jesus. What a privilege those 11 men had to hear the first five verses. They've been given a a sneak peek, and so have we, by God's grace, into the everlasting eternal love relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And the glory and the love that they share is obvious in those first five verses. But now imagine their shock those 11 men as Jesus, I believe, standing on the Temple Mount, begins now to pray for them. 
I am praying for them. And he begins to describe them in his prayer. He's not, he's not doing that for God the Father's benefit, by the way. He's not informing God the Father, as, as is so often the case, and Jesus even said back in John 11 at Lazarus' tomb, I'm praying these things for the benefit of my hearers so that they learn and they're in awe of who I am, my relationship with the Father. And so he, he begins to describe them, and I don't know what you, you think might have happened, but in my mind's eye, as I picture uh, Jesus standing and praying in the Jewish way with his eyes to the heavens and open palms and, and no doubt they're all praying with him but they're just shocked at what they're hearing. No one's ever prayed like this. They've never heard anything like this in a prayer. And then he says, I'm praying for them and he describes them to the Father as men who have kept your word. And as those who have received the word of God that has come through Christ and believed in who Jesus is. Was Jesus let go of reality here? I mean, he just said in the, at the end of chapter 16 that all of these men are getting ready to leave him in his moment of need. They're all going to abandon him. He's already said that. But he has also repeatedly affirmed that their, their belief, fledgling though it may be, it is genuine. That they do believe, that they have received, that they have kept. That verb in the Greek is a perfect tense word. That verb, they have kept your word. They, they have in the past. They are now. They will. It's looking at the whole of it. And I am glorified or I have been glorified in them. That's a perfect passive God is glorifying Jesus in these 11 men. He has been, he is, he will. Now I don't know about what you think might be happening at this point, but I'm just imagining that as Jesus is lavishing these loving, gracious, kind words upon these men, one of two things probably is happening. They may at this point be kind of like kids when you're praying and they think something that was said is a little funny or and then they start peeking around at one another. Like, do you hear do you hear what he's saying? We've kept his word. We're... Or maybe the second scenario is that human pride is at work, and you can imagine Peter glances over at Thomas and in a way that kind of says, Well, he's talking about me now, Thomas. <laughs> That, no, surely not you. I've kept his word. He, he doesn't mean you. He's, he's, a, he's talking about me now. Well, this is a glimpse now into the great love and grace of Jesus for his people. That he also describes them in these loving, kind, and gracious ways. See, what's really on display here is not the greatness of the apostles. Oh, we know better. We've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's on display here is the greatness of God in His Son, Jesus Christ, in the person and work of Jesus. And the big lesson we learn in our passage today as we eavesdrop on this greatest of all prayers is that Jesus is the perfect prophet and priest whose passion for his people is unparalleled. Let me say it again. Jesus is the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, and his passion for his people as he prays is unparalleled. Jesus prays as the perfect prophet. He prays as the perfect priest. And he prays for his people with unparalleled passion. So I preach to you today, Jesus, the perfect prophet. This theme of the prophet, the long-awaited one. It has come up in John's gospel repeatedly, hasn't it? Let's remind ourselves. Go back to John 1, verse 21. You remember in Deuteronomy 18, as you're turning to John 1, remember that in Deuteronomy 18, 15, God through Moses promised there's going to be another prophet who will arise like Moses, but he'll be greater than Moses. He'll be so great that if you ignore him and his word, you seal your everlasting doom. And so for thousands of years now, they've waited for this prophet. 
And so we, we see this theme in John 1, verse 21. They ask John the Baptist, who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? So there we have it. Verse 25, it happens again. They ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? Happens again in verse 45. We have found him, right? Philip says to Nathaniel, whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. This prophet, this long-awaited prophet is also associated with the Messiah in John 4, verse 19, the woman at the well. She says to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then, of course, she confesses him in verse 25 as the Messiah, the Christ, and goes and tells her people, I think I've found the Christ. In John 6, verse 14 and 15, the theme continues. In John 6, after Jesus feeds the the 5,000. Verse 14, it says, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. See the association with the Messiah? And Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. In chapter 7, verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. And others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? In Matthew chapter 21, you see this connection very clearly on, in the way Matthew describes what happened on Palm Sunday. And in Matthew 21, Verse 8, it says, The disciples went and Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And I'll just remind you that prophets represented God to the people. It's what prophets did. They represented God to the people by their word. Thus saith the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. And by their works. An example of that would be the prophet Hosea, who is commanded by God to go take a prostitute named Gomer as his wife. And when she proves unfaithful, he goes and gets her again. Why? Because in Hosea we're told, you are a living drama. You are representing God to the people. And Gomer is representing the people. That's what you've done to me, God's saying. What, what Gomer did to Hosea, that's what all of Israel did to God. They're unfaithful to him, and yet he's faithful to just continue to pursue them and rescue them with his redeeming love. We could use other prophets, but I think you get the point. Prophets represent God to the people. They speak God's word, and they do works. They dramatize, if you will, the relationship that God has with his wayward people. And now Jesus prays, I have manifested your name to the people that you gave me out of the world. God's name is all that he is. In the Bible, that's how names work. They describe the very being and character. A name is, is, is the person. It's how we come to know who God is. Jesus has manifested God. His very character, his very being. He has, as John began his gospel in the prologue, John 1.18, he said, Jesus was in the Father's bosom and he has made him known to us. The Greek there, he has exegeted God. That means to know out of or to expose. We know God in Jesus. Who is he? We know because of who Jesus is. What does God do? We know because of what Jesus does. This has been John's theme, hasn't it? He speaks God's word. He does God's work. He is the full, final word and revelation and manifestation of all that God is. 
And we know God in His Word, don't we? Because of these beautiful names He has revealed Himself. For example, He is the God who sees. He is the God who hears. He is a God who heals. He is a God who fights. He is a God who delivers. He is a God who reigns. And on and on it goes. God reveals His character, His being, His essence by His name. Jesus shows us all that God is. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 138 too. That God has exalted above all His word and His name. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the name of God. His name means Yahweh is salvation. Paul says in Philippians 2, and we looked at it a few weeks ago, when uh, Christ has emptied himself and taken on the form of a servant and he was obedient even to the point of death. Therefore, Paul says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And that's a quote from Isaiah where Yahweh says, every name will confess. Everybody will confess my name and every knee will bow to me. Yahweh been the name has been given to Jesus because he is Yahweh in the flesh he is the Yahweh who saves he is the God who is the Savior Jesus says this again in the prayer that uh, the name of God has been given to him in verse 12 you see it I kept them in your name which you have given me I manifested your name. He's praying, you see, as the perfect prophet. The one who fully and finally reveals the very character and being of God to us. I preach to you, Jesus, the perfect priest. The prophet represented God to the people. What did the priest do? The priest represented the people to God. We see these In the Old Testament, we see this also in New Testament, but the book of Exodus in particular speaks of Moses, for example, being the prophet of God. And God even says, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. So that's the prophet. But the priest is Aaron. And in Exodus 28, we get this example uh, of Aaron's garb, his priestly garb. And it has the names, you remember, of the 12 tribes of Israel inscribed on it. And so he goes into the Holy of Holies once a year to beg God's atoning mercies on behalf of the people who are named. He carries the people to the presence of God. This is what a priest does. He bears up under the names of the people of God and he represents them to the Father. And we ought to stand back and just be stunned to hear Jesus praying in such solidarity with his people. Jesus can say what no other priest could ever say. He doesn't just say the Father has temporarily entrusted some people to his soul care. No, he claims sovereign ownership over them with God the Father. God owned them in eternity past. He gave them to Jesus. Jesus owns them. All mine are yours. All yours are mine. This is a keeping, a preserving, a protecting, a sovereign share of ownership, if you will, in the very sheep of God. This theme is dominant in this prayer. In verse 2, he says, you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Verse 6, All those whom you have given me out of the world, yours they were, and he passed, you see, yours they were, and you gave them to me. Verses 9 through 11, he repeats it again. I'm praying for those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. Verse 24. 
Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. You see this? Over and over and over. We, we already highlighted it two weeks ago. We have to highlight it again because it is a dominant drum beat. This is highlighting the electing grace of God in the salvation of his people. God has known his people from eternity past. It's not a surprise to him when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he planned that out a long time ago. They were yours, Jesus said. You gave them to me. That's why they come, John 6, 37 says. All you have given me will come to me. This is what Jesus said in John 10. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. And none shall pluck out of Father's hand. I and Father are one. You hearing the the summary in, in John 17 of all the doctrine that 16 chapters could contain. In just this one 26 verse prayer. Literally. Summarizing what it means to be chosen, to be in Christ before the foundation of the world. To be born again, born of God, born of the Spirit. John began his gospel this way and now Jesus' prayer is summarizing yet again what we have already heard John say right off the bat. He said, Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. But to those who did receive him, who believed in his name. Are you hearing the same themes? To them he gave the right to become the children of God. How does that happen? How does somebody receive and believe and become the children of God? Well, to be a child you got to be born. John says you become a children of God by being born of God. And then he goes through a list of what you're not born of. How did you not get saved? Well, you weren't born of the blood. wasn't natural lineage. You weren't born of the will of the flesh. wasn't wasn't your effort, your, your will ultimately that was in charge of this. Wasn't a husband, not, not born of a, a man, which is a way to say you don't get married into this by human marriage or you don't ride your husband's coattails or your dad or your mom or anything like that. No, he says you're born of, of God. It's that simple. You have to be born of God. To be his child. And Jesus prays for these disciples. And all these things are true of them. They belonged to God. They still belong to God. They will always belong to God in Christ. And I don't want to say too much about this because we'll hit this in two weeks when I'm back. But the saving grace of God in Christ, it plucks, it snatches Sinners out of the world. You see how Jesus says, you have given them to me out of the world. And it distinguishes them from the world. This will come up uh, repeatedly in this prayer. But Jesus distinguishes his people from the world, doesn't he? I'm not praying for the world. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't have compassion for the world of sinners. Oh, he does. He, he's, going to actually, he's actually going to pray for the world in this prayer once we keep going through it but now he's honed in especially on these 11 men who are standing there with him his disciples and they're distinguished from the world if by nothing else because they have kept God's word hello I'm preaching the sermon I'll preach again in two weeks but this will become very very clear as we continue through this prayer Real Christians, real disciples of Jesus, keep the word of God. Not perfectly or sinlessly, but consistently by his grace. It is the mark of our lives to submit ourselves to the word of the living God. Jesus said back in John 8, 31, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. He says it again here. When electing grace snatches a sinner out of the world, it 
sharply then begins to distinguish that man or that woman from the ways and the will and the wisdom of the world. Jesus, he's praying for his people as the perfect prophet. He's praying for his people as the perfect priest. This is a particular prayer, isn't it, for a particular people? That only a perfect prophet and priest with unparalleled passion could possibly pray. Jesus is praying for those saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And it's definitely to God's glory alone. I preach to you, Jesus, with unparalleled passion. I don't mean his passion as in uh, his strong feelings, although he has those, and they're, they're clear in this prayer. I'm talking about his passion. Why is he offering this prayer at this moment? Because within hours he'll hang on the cross. He knows full well what's, what he's facing and what's going on, and it's foremost on his mind. His crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and then his sending of the Spirit. This is what he's been saying for three chapters, isn't it, in the upper room discourse. He's been talking about these things incessantly, we might even say. This is what's foremost on his mind. I mean, he began this prayer, Father, the hour has come. The hour that he'll make atonement for the sins of God's people. The moment of atonement that the world has waited on. It was planned in eternity past and it is here, he says. And I want you to see that his passion is unparalleled in its effects. Effects. E-F-F-E-C-T-S. Unparalleled in its effects. Jesus prays, I, I don't know if you noticed, but there is not one stitch of uncertainty in a single word of this prayer. Has that dawned on you? This prayer is absolutely certain. Everything about it is set in stone. It, it's going to happen. It's as good as done. It is assurance uh, times one million. I can't put into words. If you just read and keep reading it, every word of it is rock solid certainty. The passion of Jesus, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his sending of the Spirit, it will absolutely affect things. And you can see that in the way Jesus describes his people here. Number one, it will affect his unparalleled passion, will affect faith in the word of Christ and the Christ of the word. Now they know. You see that? They've been given certainty. They know. They know who I am. They know I came forth from you. They've believed that you sent me. And I've given them the words. All of this is because I've given them your words. God's word written down. Testifies to the word made flesh and it's effective in the life of those that the Father has given to the Son. It affects faith in the word of Christ and the Christ of the word. Number two, it affects faithfulness to the word of Christ and the Christ of the word. I already emphasized that, but let me just remind you. Jesus said back in John 14 in the upper room discourse, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And now he prays and he describes his, his boys that are standing around him. They have kept your word. Do you see what Jesus' passion affects? Faith and faithfulness. They always go hand in hand, by the way. Number three. Friendship with God in Christ. The upper room discourse was full of intimate language. Abide in me. The Father and I will come make our home with you. We're going to put our spirit in you. He'll dwell within you. My words will be 
in you. This is all such intimate stuff. Jesus says, I've called you friends. If you do what I tell you, you're friends because I've revealed the very heart and mind of God to you. I've not withheld these things. I've manifested his name, you see, to you. There's an intimacy when you're saved. Being saved is not just an intellectual assent to who Jesus is. It is that. It has to be at least that. But I, I am... The longer I serve as pastor and I minister to people and I, I see what seems to me to be so often missing. And I, and I have to say, if it's missing from your life, it's probably because you're not saved. Jesus says, this is eternal life in this prayer. That they may know you, the one true God. And he whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I'm asking again, as I did two weeks ago, do you know him? Is there an intimacy? Is there a friendship? Is there a real relationship with you and God and Jesus Christ? This friendship, it oozes from this prayer, doesn't it? They know who I am, he says. They know you sent me. They know I came forth from you. They've received my, uh, your word through me. All of this stuff is intimate language. And in verses 25 and 26, he ends the prayer. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you, know that you sent me, and I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Do you hear? Do you feel the intimacy, the friendship that saved people have with their Savior. It's a friendship affected by Christ's unparalleled passion. We've been reconciled, we who were enemies, now have been made friends. It affects, number four, fruitfulness, which Jesus defines quite simply as His glory in His people. I have been glorified in them. I have been, I am, I will be. Jesus' glory, by the way, will be brought to full flower. Look at verse 24 of the prayer. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. His glory in them will be brought to its full and final end. And what a day that will be. When our Jesus we shall see. And we look upon His face, the one who saved us by His grace. And He takes us by the hand, church, and leads us through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Is Jesus being glorified in you, in me, in us? If so... It will be brought to its rightful end. We will see his face. His passion's unparalleled in its effects. It's also unparalleled in its effects. It, it causes affections to change. A F F E C T. And I just want to quickly remind you of three of these. As Jesus praise and his passion is on his mind and in his heart you see he's going to the cross in just a few hours his passion affects God himself do you know how I know that from the prayer I know it's not super explicit but follow me here and you'll hear some victory shouts from Jesus in this prayer I am coming to you well hallelujah not I hope to, not I may if I can pull this atonement thing off. No, you see the certainty of it. I'm coming to you. That assumes everything that the gospel proclaims is captured in that one statement. That God, just like Isaiah prophesied, will see the travail of his son's soul and will be satisfied. 
And he'll bring many sons to glory. He'll be accepted. He'll be coronated. Oh, hallelujah. That's a victory shout, isn't it, from your Savior? I'm coming to you. This thing's done. Woo. And God's affections can then be set upon me and you. It's the only way. If Jesus doesn't do this thing for his people, and if he can't pray the way he prays, I am coming to you. Victorious over sin and death on behalf of my people. And I'm praying to you as their prophet and as their priest. Well, hallelujah. God's affections are changed towards us. He's already said to his disciples, the Father himself loves you. It's all because of Jesus' unparalleled passion. I need to move on. It affects, A-F-F-E-C-T, the disciples. Do you hear the victory shout? And that simple phrase when Jesus describes them as those who have believed. Jesus didn't come and die to make salvation possible for everyone, but certain for no one. That's just not how God works. We're the inefficient ones, not God. They have believed. And he's going to pray in verse 24, all who will believe through their word. Our affections are changed for God. I mean, what is faith? It is not just affection, but it's, it's definitely affection. It's why love and faith, they, they go hand in hand, don't they? If you love me, you keep my commandments, believe in me. You can't truly savingly place faith in Jesus and not love him. I mean, come on. We believed that he is the sent son of God, the Savior. That's a victory shout from Jesus. And it will affect the world. Do you hear a victory shout when Jesus says, they are in the world. I'm no longer in the world. I'm coming to you, but they're in the world. Now, you might think, well, that, sounds, that doesn't sound good. The world is broken. It's a mess. Yeah, but why did Jesus leave them in the world? Why is he leaving you in the world right now if you're a Christian? To be salt, to be light, to have an effect. The world will come to know Jesus Christ only by the word of God. Christ that comes through his people. Well, hallelujah. I need, to, I need to wrap this up. Had a good day of worship here at church. I just, I just want you to think this week. Soak in who Jesus is. That he prays for his people with unparalleled passion as a perfect prophet, a perfect priest. And it has impacted and it will impact the world. Do you doubt that? Well, just think that in the last 24 hours, God's glory in Jesus Christ has spread all over the world and been savored all over the world. Worshippers have gathered to celebrate and worship and bow down to the one true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the jungles of Peru. And in the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro, worshipers of Jesus Christ met in Bangkok and Beijing, in Hong Kong and Hanoi, far-flung islands of Papua New Guinea and Bali, Indonesia, in India, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Moscow and Siberia, in London and Paris, in Nairobi and Nigeria, in jungle tribes of Cameroons, uh, Cameroonians, they baptized new believers today and they danced to the beat of their ancient drums and then all the way over here in Little Old Corridor. Here we are. Here we are. Still saying, Jesus is our perfect prophet and priest and king and Lord and Savior. Oh, the wonder that it started with 11 men standing around Jesus 2,000 years ago, hearing him say, Father, the hour's come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. I have manifested your name to those you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. 
And I am praying for them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for including us in your sovereign plan and in your sweet prayer. Will you save more sinners even here among us today? May your prayer, Lord Jesus, continue to be answered right here among us and to the ends of the earth. Amen.